So welcome everybody. Welcome to our Kaleidoscope lecture. Very happy to see so many people joining us this evening in Toronto time. Uh, welcome to the Color Research Society of Canada. I would just like to begin with our land acknowledgement. The Color Research Society's activities related to sharing color knowledge takes place across Canada understood as part of Turtle Island, the ancestral homelands of over 630 First Nation communities, representing more than 50 Indigenous nations and languages. We work to respect, affirm, and support where necessary the inherent treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across these lands and waters. Our commitment to honoring the knowledge, ways of knowing, and wisdom of Turtle Island's Indigenous peoples aims to contribute to the decolonizing work required today for moving towards a just society. So I would what, like to welcome everybody. I'm uh, Robin Kingsborough. I'm the president of the CRSC. And I just have a couple of oops, announcements to share with you. I would like to um, encourage you, if you're not a member, to join us. Uh, we have our Kaleidoscope series where we have monthly talks through the uh, fall, winter and spring uh, sessions. And we've just, uh, we're trying to um, work on our membership um, benefits. We've started having members nights this year. So we're really working hard to um, foster a Canadian uh, community of color enthusiasts. So if you haven't joined, please consider joining. The membership costs are modest and uh, you help support the Canadian color community. Uh, part of what we do is a student award. So we have our student award uh, deadline coming soon, March 1st. Uh, please check our website and we can put that in the chat too. Uh, if you are a student uh, at a Canadian institution or know a student, uh, please let them know. And the deadline again is March 1st. Uh, we, as the winners of our student awards get to give talks to um, as part of our lecture series and uh, they get their information shared on our website and they also get a small cash prize, which is always helpful for students. So uh, one thing that we very much like to do is, is to support the Canadian uh, student community for color research. Um, I'm very excited to uh, welcome our speaker for this evening. And I met John at the um, Color Impact Conference last June in Rochester and uh, heard very enthusiastic things about a talk he gave. So he's going to share some of his insights today about the power of red. John Seymour is an applied mathematician and color scientist. He teaches color science at Clemson University and consults as John the Math Guy. Uh, he holds 31 patents, has written 71 publications and presentations, and he writes a blog described as applied math and color science with a liberal sprinkling of goofy humor. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing some of that goofy humor. And uh, John, take it away. Thank you, Robin. It is definitely a pleasure to be speaking all these people to all these people from Canada. Uh, I will try to uh, speak in Canadian, eh? And uh, I'll see if I can do go about about that well, but I will probably lapse back into my American accent. Uh, one thing I want to answer right off the top is why am I doing this talk on color psychology? Um, it's a crazy topic for me to take up because I'm an engineer, a mathematician. Um, but let me, I'll give you some background on that to help you to see where I'm coming from. Uh, I teach a class, I started teaching a class several years ago at uh, Clemson University. Uh, there is a university involved. It's not it's more than just a football team. Uh, <laughs> I started teaching a class in the graphic arts there. And uh People were, my students were kind of interested in psychology. Every time uh, they wanted to do some kind of a class project, it always had to do with 
color psychology. So I said, okay, I'll throw in a few classes about that, a couple of lectures here and there. And um, I began to realize that you find a lot of stuff, a lot of information about color psychology on the internet. Uh, if you Google uh, color psychology, you get uh, 1.3 gazillion hits. And um, most of them are garbage. Most of them are saying things like, yellow is a happy color and uh, green uh, symbolizes this and uh, gray is a dark color that uh, reminds us that Seinfeld isn't on, on the, no episodes aren't being created anymore. Uh, all of these, all this stuff that is, uh, some of it may be true, but most of it is completely without any sort of backing. There's nothing to say why this might be true. There's no experiments behind it. So I thought, you know, my students want to catch some of this color psychology. A lot of them are going to wind up being um, graphic designers or something like that, where they are going to be involved with color and uh, applied color psychology. In other words, marketing, trying to sell something, trying to uh, con convey information with the subtle use of color. So this is important stuff for them to be learning. So why red? Red is, uh, I'll give you an anecdote to start off with. Uh, this guy is, uh, let's say his name is Rex. I don't know what his name is, but let's pretend his name is Rex. He's middle-aged, which means that he thinks he's going to live to about 110. Um, he's driving a, a, his new car. He just bought this new car, uh, a convertible, obviously. And um, somebody unmute yourself and tell me what color you think his car is. Red. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of obvious, I think. That's a, that is a cliche. That is the, the stereotypical car. You can tell it goes fast because it's red. Now, my car, on the other hand, I have a 2005 Honda Civic. It will go from 0 to 60 in about 2.47 days. Uh, it's not red. It's gray. So we have this expectation. We have this psychological uh something underplaying this that says that red would be the color that you buy if you're a middle-aged guy and if you want to start uh, pretending that you're not middle-aged anymore. Let me talk more about red, though. Why? Let's give some actual science that says that red is an important color. First off, in 1969, two uh, researchers, Berlin and Kay, enlisted the help of a lot of different missionaries all across the world. They sent them charts with all kinds of colors on them, and they had the missionaries ask the natives what colors they saw. What name do you put on those colors? And they had some interesting findings. Uh, one of them in particular is about the, the growth of language through time. On the far left-hand side, we see uh, kind of a cryptic part of this chart, W, R, yellow, Y, that's white, red, yellow, and BK for black, green, blue. All of those colors um, in the nascent languages, you would typically have just two color names. You would have white and black. And everything that was a brighter color, you would call white. Everything that is a darker color, you would call black. Gradually through time, another color gets added, and they found that the color, the second, or excuse me, the third color that's added was always red. Red has some sort of a primal importance to us that when languages are being fabricated, when they're being developed, somebody says, hey, let's uh, make red a special color. So based on that, I'm going to say red has some sort of an important uh, uh, meaning to us. Now I'll bring in some more scientific evidence, some more something more recent. Uh, recent. This is from Domicelli Gianascaita, and I think I have actually pronounced her name right. I did meet her once. Fascinating person. Uh, she had recruited four thousand six hundred volunteers in thirty different countries. This was an internet type of experiment, and they were to match twenty different emotion terms happy, sad, things like that, with 12 different color names. In other words, she's asking, 
how do you associate, what color do you associate with this emotion? This is the chart that she would use. You would see if you were taking this experiment, you would see red up on the top and then it'd say, what do you associate that with? And there's all these little circles for you to click on to say, um, you'll notice that uh, in the lower right-hand corner, love is filled in. This person had selected that as a big uh, connection to them. They also associate uh, red with anger, somewhat less. But uh, basically, all of the subjects of this experiment were given the opportunity to go through all of the colors and, and uh, mark off those colors that had some sort of an emotional connection with them. And here's the results simplified. We see on the left-hand column here, interest, amusement, pride, joy, pleasure, etc. And on the bottom, we see red, orange, yellow, green, uh, the 12 colors that were in her experiment. And we see the color in each one of those boxes. It's a, a fire code, I guess they would call that. The dark red means the strongest uh, association. In other words, the most people agreed that in this case, red and love are the, that's the strongest connection. So based on this multicultural experiment, I think we can say that red is primal when it comes to something to do with our psychological feelings about colors. The strongest connection is between red and love. Now, here I have another very, very scientific experiment. <laughs> uh, I did a blog on this a while ago. Uh, I looked at si six different psychology pundits, people who claim to be experts at color and psychology, and I looked at what they had to say. What did they have to say about red? What adjectives did they use? Uh, I found a very common theme was that red revs you up. These are the different uh, phrases that were in these uh, six different, uh, there's uh, three blogs and three books that I went through. Passion or passionate, speeds up of the metabolism, exciting energy, aggressive enthusiasm. Those are all terms that are like, yes, rev things up. And then I did this. And I did the same thing looking at the opposite mellows you out. This is a list of all of the phrases that were in those six sources, all of the phrases that say red calms you down somehow. So we see that there is a consensus among these six self-proclaimed experts. There is a consensus that red is an exciting color. So here's my evidence for saying that red is worth considering in this uh, view of things. Color of the middle age crisis, sports car, obvious. Red is the third color adopted in nascent, nascent languages. It's the strongest linguistic connection that we found. And color pundits agree that red has this psychological effect on people, physiological effect. So I'm going to make the claim that if there is anything to this whole color psychology business, if there's anything to it at all, it's got to show up in red. And it's got to show up in diamonds in red. So the first claim, red means love. That was the, the strongest connection that uh, Jonas Skaita found. Why do we associate red with love? Well, flowers and not just flowers, but roses. I hope that uh, many people will be receiving roses tomorrow and Valentine's Day cards that you remember from third grade. Oh, I hated that. But they're all red. So clearly, that's why we associate red with love, because of Valentine's Day, or I don't know. That's, that sounds chicken and egg-ish to me. Is it... Uh, does Valentine's Day mean that red become, became the color of love? Or is it the other way around, that Valentine's Day became red because red is the color of love? I don't know. I can't answer that. Now, before I get into more deep psychology here, I want to talk about three related hypotheses about color and psychology. The first 
is that people associate specific colors with specific emotions. That's what Jonas Skaita's experiment was about. You name a color and they name the associated uh, feelings that go along with it. That's kind of level one. Level two, colors evoke specific physiological responses, like red revs you up. It has a physiological response that causes adrenaline and uh, blood pressure and all this kind of stuff. That's a second level of, a, of hypothesis that we, we could uh, post thinking about color. The third one is that it evokes specific emotional responses. Red makes us hungry, for example. Does it? I don't know. But that's a third level of... Uh, of response here. And then the fourth of the three is that colors, specific colors, can stimulate a specific action. This is the marketing thing. If I make this product red, people will buy it because of the color. The color will enhance the ability for the product to jump off the shelf. So let's look at this question here. Does red make you sexy? Oh, baby. Well, there was an experiment that was done. This is not a, um, uh, how would I put this? This is a good experiment, but I wouldn't, this isn't a laboratory type of experiment. These folks, uh, Kramer et al., looked at the color of the clothes in this British dating show. In the British dating show, they had people come in, they filmed them before the uh, picking out the dates, and then on the date, they film them. So there's there's footage of what these people were wearing when they initially showed up for the interviews and also when they were on the date. And they looked at the question, they had, they had quite a number of people. They had 500 people that were filmed that they had uh, looked through the films of. I can't imagine looking through all of that. Male, female, uh, and they were male, female, comparisons and people, males who dated males and females who dated females. So this is all, all combinations here. They looked at those films and they found something very interesting that on the date, people were more likely to wear red. Hmm. This is taking account, this is taking into account the fact that some people will wear red more frequently uh because they're looking at now the difference of how many people wore red before the date and how many people on the date wore red but there was a preponderance for some reason people were wearing more red when they went on the date and they also found out that people tended to wear black more often now i should back up just a slide here hang on uh, this was reported in psychology today which is an online uh, place, reputable place. But I have a beef to pick with them. The title of their article was, What Colors Should You Wear on a First Date? And they described the experiment from Kramer and Mulgrew. The experiment itself was in a, a journal. But um, I got a beef to pick with them on this title, What Colors Should You Wear on a First Date? It's not about what you should wear. It's what people decided to wear. It didn't, the, there was nothing in the original paper that tried to determine whether or not the dates were successful as a result of the red. So this isn't, a, this isn't dating advice. This doesn't say if you wear red, you are more likely to get a second date. That's not the point of the experiment. It didn't, it didn't have a way to test for that. Uh, it's simply... If you're going on a date, people tend to wear red more often. And there we come to one of the uh, uh, issues what I, that I brought up, the, the different levels of hypothesis. What they were testing is a what people do rather than what the result of them wearing red is. So the article on psychology today didn't really even answer the question that was posted in their uh, title. So I'm making a claim here that it's easy to conflate these three slash four different ideas. 
if we see some evidence, if we read an article about some experiment that took place, we need to read it carefully to find out whether or not we're talking about the colors were associated, whether or not there's a physiological response, whether there's a psychological response, and whether or not there's an action taken. Those are four different things, and it's very easy to confuse them. So, do red clothes make people sexy? That's a, a very reasonable question to ask because we don't know the answer to that yet. This woman decided to wear this lovely red velvet dress on a date. Uh, but we don't know whether or not that had an effect. Did that make the person she was dating think that she was more attractive? Well, this is an, this is an article here, Elliot and Niesta, that uh, looked at five different experiments that were done on women wearing red. They would do things like uh, have a photograph that was altered so that one photograph would have her wearing red and the other one would have her wearing a different color. And they would ask people to look at the picture and rate her attractiveness. And uh, there were some uh, somewhat significant results. Men were, when they saw a woman who was wearing red, they deemed them sexier and more attractive, which are two slightly different things. But it didn't have any effect on how they rated the person's likability. It didn't, if a woman wears red, it doesn't make her more likable necessarily or kind or intelligent. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, men uh, don't notice that effect. In other words, if you would ask them afterward what color they were wearing, uh, try to see if there's some cognitive stuff going on that makes them think, oh, that woman is re wearing red and, and make an association. So it seems to be something that's under underneath it's uh, something that's happening subliminally rather than something that is actually brought into the conscious part of the mind to, to make that decision. And they also found that women weren't swayed. Women looking at women, and here I would guess just by probabilities that this is heterosexual women, uh, weren't swayed by women wearing red. They wouldn't look at a woman and say she's sexier because she's wearing red. So this is an interesting result, and that's kind of kind of goes along with what we would perhaps think, what we would believe if we were to read the internet. How about making men sexy? Obviously, this guy is very attractive to most women. Is he attractive because he is wearing red? Well, women do deem men sexier if they have red clothes on or if there's a red background in the picture. Men appear higher in status as well when they're wearing red. And it doesn't, just like with the earlier experiments, it doesn't affect whether or not women look at the man and say, oh, he's likable, agreeable, or an extrovert. And similarly, similarly as before, it doesn't affect men's assessment of other men. So this is a a uh, little pictorial that shows the different relationships. Uh, basically, in the corners here, the lower left-hand corner and the upper right-hand corner, we have the uh, male-to-female uh, viewing. And basically, it says red makes somebody look more attractive. Or do it. Or does it? Here's another paper. This is also written by Andrew Elliott. This is a follow-up to his earlier one. Um, he investigated an isolated village in West Africa. So this is a village that is far away from uh, the Western cultural cultural experience. Experience the they so they would not have clued in, been clued in on the ideas that we have as uh, North Americans and Italians. Uh, they wouldn't know those basic uh, concepts, those cultural concepts. They showed them pictures of women wearing red. They showed the men and the, the same basic experiment set up, and they found the same effect. Oh, okay, so this is interesting. It appears that this effect is something that's universal, that happens everywhere. It's not something that we learn in culture. 
Now, there was a, a bigger analysis that was done, Peppercorn et, et al. Uh, this is a few years later than the other ones. It's more bigger than the other experiments. There were three studies, a total of 830 men. So that is quite a large experiment to be dealing with that many people to, to collect data on all of them. Uh, their result that failed to support this red effect. Oh, even more bigger analysis. This is Lehman and Elliot. Andrew Elliot again is involved in this paper. They took more data. They did a meta-analysis, which means that they took a number of different studies and they combined, they pooled all of the results from that. As a result, they had almost 3,000 men and almost 3,000 women. So this is an incredibly large database of information. And let's see what they found out. They found that for men, there is a small but statistically significant difference. In other words, if someone, if a woman were to wear red, there would be a very slight advantage to her. They would view her as more attractive and it does, does hold up statistically, but it's small. And for women, they found it was not small, but tiny, very small difference. And it was not statistically significant. So the idea of red and love, does red make someone look attractive? We associate those two words. That's what Jonas Gaita's uh, experiment showed. Uh, but the psychological effect, not the effect of association, but the psychological effect is either big, small, or non-existent. It could be my universal though, universally non-existent or universally existent. So that's a bit disappointing. I mean, if you read what's on the internet, it's like, bang, it is a slam dunk. You wear red, you are going to be picked out of a line. Yes. So let's take another, another look at another emotion. We saw in Jonas Gaita's experiment that anger was number two in terms of the uh, association of over all colors. Anger and red were associated. Does it make you angry? Now, the upper picture... Some of you will remember the Mythbusters episode where they tested this. Do, does a red cape make a bull angry? Well, those of you who understand uh, color vision in animals will realize that most mammals are uh, red, green, colorblind. They have the green cone, they don't have the red cone. So no, what they see, what that bull sees when it looks at that red cape is black and not red. So. And that was bore out in the experiment. They tried different colors of capes and it didn't make a difference. The, the red did not incite anger. Uh, the bottom picture was from the uh, movie. And if, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the movie. This was a, a cute uh, uh, movie done by Disney, Pixar, uh, where they showed the emotions living in people's head, in a person's head, and the emotion in the head was red for anger. So it is popularly believed that red and anger are associated. Here we see Jonas Gaita's uh, uh, experimental results. Well, let's take that back a little bit to the physiological level. Does it have an effect? There were so many earlier experiments. Um, Gerard, in the year that I was born, did this experiment where he showed people red, white, and blue, those colors individually, one at a time, and he measured their galvanic skin response, which means that he put electrodes on them and measured the voltage across the electrodes. Uh, basically, that's a measure of the skin conductance. It's a measure of how much moisture is on the skin. It's a measure of uh, whether or not you're sweating. So if you sweat, your galvanic skin response Will, will change. And he found that uh, red had a more significant effect, a change, caused a change in the GSR. White was somewhat less effective and blue was least effective. Excuse me. He repeated that experiment later on, looking at heart rate and the respiration rate, the rate that you're breathing in and out. His results were inconclusive. Well, Following down this, we see uh, one, two, three, four, about, I don't know, there's about 10 different experiments there 
where uh, people were looking at a physiological, something you can measure, uh, EEG, electroencephalogram, uh, uh, skin conduction, uh, melatonin. One of the experimenters uh, pulled uh, blood samples and looked for melatonin in the blood. And uh, one of them had a, 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 one of those things that you put on top of somebody's heads with all the electrodes, and they were doing, doing looking for gamma band oscillations, which is some sort of an oscillation in the brain. And uh, you'll see that the results, about half of the time, well, four out of 10, red was shown to be uh, more effective at stimulating, that it does actually stimulate. So this would lend credence to this earlier experiments would, would lend credence to what you find on the internet that rev that red revs you up. But some of the more recent experiments, and in particular the last one, uh, showed that uh, that effect isn't there. Red, according to Stouch et al, uh, is equivalent to green. Now they explained it like this: the strength of the human color gamma responses. In other words, the, the brain activity uh, for stimuli on the LM axis, that is the long and the medium cone axis, red versus green, could well be explained by the LM cone contrast. Let me explain that a little bit. When I show somebody, if I'm an experimenter, I show somebody red, what do I show them? Do I find a piece of red construction paper? Do I take a plaque? and paint it with red paint. And if I do, what shade of red do I use? That's all important because the, uh, according to their research, the explanation of this has to do with the strength of the richness of the particular colors that people were shown. And they make the claim that perhaps if it had all been equalized, if they had gone through very careful selection of the colors to make sure that they were the same richness of color, whatever that means, however they would measure that, that the results would not have shown up. That the reason why people were getting more excited is because the color was richer rather than the actual hue of the color. So, so far we have some mixed results. Does red make women look sexy to men? There's a small effect. Does red make men look sexy to women? There's a tiny effect. Red revs you up, or then again, maybe it doesn't rev you up. Here's another line of research that's kind of interesting. Um, people look at the looked at the idea of whether the uniform color, the color of a uniform of a sports team, has an effect on various parts of the game. Do they win? Do they get more fouls, less fouls, etc.? This was started back in 1988 by Frank and Gilovich, and they found that black was an effective color if you want to win. So the teams that wore, wore black had a preponderance of winning more games. Uh, we see later on, there is some significant response to red. Red seems to be an important uh, color for uniforms. Um, in particular, one was uh, they showed uh, a goalie, a hockey goalie. This is the Canadian part now. So it's a hockey goalie who's looking at films he's watching somebody playing against them they're taking a foul shot so they're slapping the puck and hitting and uh, heading for his face uh they're different the the players in these videos have different color uniforms and basically he they found in this experiment that the uh people looking at the 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 um, goalies who were looking at these films would tend to rate the people wearing red as more aggressive and more talented. So there does seem to be something to this. Then again, I had one of my students uh, look at uh, soccer matches from uh, over a period of 20 or 30 years, European soccer matches, and looked at the, the colors that the kits, kit is the uh, uniform in soccer, the color of the kits for these. And he found that the, there wasn't any statistical significance to this idea. So again, I think this is something that is uh, there. There is some reason for it to be there. Um, we're not real sure about it, but uh, there does seem to be some sort of an advantage, although it's not a huge advantage so far. Uh, 
red making women sexy, making men sexy, red revs you up, or maybe not red advantages probably give a small advantage and uh, in the Olympics, in uh, uh, fighting type of uh, uh, sports, uh, taekwondo, et cetera, things like that, they will flip a coin to decide who wears red and who wears blue in order to alleviate any possibility of there being an advantage. Now, one thought might be that uh, maybe we can read the red in somebody's face Maybe there is a, an evolutionary advantage for a social animal like a human being. Maybe there's a cycle, uh, a, a evolutionary advantage that would mean that uh, if I can tell when somebody is blushing or when somebody is getting angry, it can lend to better harmony in the tribe. So that's the, that's the thought here. Detecting anger in a face might be an important thing that would get uh, bred into us through evolution. Here's uh, Andrew Elliott. We heard his name a couple times already. Dominance in aggressive encounters is signaled by the bright red oxygenation blood, oxygenated blood visible on highly vascularized bare skin. You gotta love somebody who can talk like that. That is wonderful. Vascularized means the uh, skin that has blood vessels underneath it. Um, imagine you're sitting at a bar, somebody comes up to you and they poke you in the, in the shoulder and they, you can see their face is red. You know that they are being the dominant one. That's what he's saying here. A testosterone surge, which happens largely in males, pr produces visible reddening on the face and hands, uh, and fear, on the other hand, leads to pallor, a lighter color. So there is certainly uh, an advantage to be able to read that from somebody else. Perceivers, people who are looking at other people, use that information about skin coloration to make inferences about the attractiveness, the health, and the dominance of conspecifics. A conspecific is somebody of the same species. Hmm, I wonder if that's true. One. One question that I have about this is uh, human beings uh, evolved largely in Africa. Um, a fair amount of that evolution occurred in Africa where people had skin that is much darker than the skin that you see in front of you now, this Norwegian uh, skin that is very, very pasty white. When I blush, it is immediately obvious. On the other hand, somebody who is from Africa, has ancestry going back there, it's not quite so likely that you're going to be able to tell when they blush. It's not as obvious. So I wonder if this is really a thing. Hmm. Another question is, can we actually detect anger in a red face? Is that something that is a communication channel that we look at somebody, we see their face is red, and subliminally we say, oh, that person is anger, is angry. Here's an experiment that was done. Uh, Paroma, Olkinen, uh, they created some artificial faces. We see all of these faces that uh, uh, have various range, uh, various range from a neutral face to scowling, angry face. And these were all created uh, digitally. Uh, and then they varied also the, the color of those images so that some are re redder, some are more orange, some are green. Um, and they showed those to people and they were, they asked those subjects to tell them what they thought, what uh, do they see any emotion in the face. And here's what they had to say about that. Both facial redness and surround redness, the red around the face, enhanced perceived anger slightly, another small effect. The magnitude of the enhancement is generally so small, so we question the practical significance of red in anger reg recognition. Perhaps it helps a little bit. Perhaps it can help you understand, oh, that person's angry, but perhaps the fact that they're swearing at you and uh, yelling and uh, poking their finger in your face, maybe that is a better way to tell whether or not somebody's angry. 
Here's another paper. Priming anger, conce priming anger concepts, in other words, making people think about anger, led individuals to be more likely to perceive the color red. So they were shown a scene where there was a small red object, and that object showed up better if people were, were trained to think about anger first. Evoking anger, in other words, if people were uh, shown a film that had angry kind of things happening that would get somebody excited, that led to individuals to be more likely to perceive red as well. Hmm, interesting. So far, we've learned about sexiness in red, that maybe there's an effect. Red revs you up or maybe not. Red uniforms probably give a small advantage. We might be able to read anger in a red face. Red is more salient when we are angry or when we're thinking about anger. Now, here's another practical question. This is a applied psychology. Take a look at these road signs. You're driving home and you see the signs for all these fast food places. They're largely red. I did a study. I counted, uh, I downloaded images from, from uh, fast food logos, and I found that 68% of fast food logos have the color red in them. Some of them have other colors as well, like McDonald's and Burger King. But 68%, two out of every three logos for fast food places have red. Huh, maybe red makes you hungry. Wouldn't that be a good use of this using red here? Brand managers or fast food restaurants apparently think that this is the case, that red enhances the appetite. And I think if you do any Googling on this, you will find that there's a strong consensus that red makes you hungry. And there's some places that say that red makes you hungry because of this other thing that red revs you up, that it causes your uh, blood pressure to go up, and that makes you hungry. I went looking for articles, for, for experiments that had been done to test this. Red is actually, according to this, Genshaw, Based on evidence that color elicits avoidance motivation, oh, stop signs, for example, red lights, blinking red lights, these things tend to make us shy away to back up a little bit. And the thought is that maybe red actually suppresses the appetite by doing this avoidance thing. We, we look at the red, we say, ooh, ooh, subconsciously we back off and that causes perhaps us to be less hungry. And in this experiment, they, uh, they set the subjects down in a waiting room, waiting to go to the what they thought was the actual experiment, where actually the experiment was done in the waiting room. There was some food sitting on the table, and they had uh, plates or cups that were red or various other colors. And they found that participants drank less from a red-labeled cup than from a blue labeled cup. They drank less. It did not make them drink more. Red did not make that. They ate less snack food from a red plate than a blue plate or a white plate. The results suggest that there is a color suppressance, uh, a red uh, appetite suppressance. Red functions as a subtle stop signal. So that's one experiment. Let's see if I can find any others. I, I spent a lot of time looking for these experiments. Independent groups of participants were presented with constant, amount, constant amounts of popcorns, chocolate chips, or moisturizing cream. Um, they were given the cream to use on their hands. It wasn't left there for them to eat, just to make sure that that's understood. Uh, red, white, or blue plates. They were asked to sample by tasting them. Uh, results confirmed that red plates reduce taste-related consumption. So now we have two papers that say that red does not enhance the appetite. Red suppresses the appetite. Two of them so far. Keep going. Here's the third experiment. Uh, while bowl color didn't seem to have any influence on flavor intensity, 
People were given the samples. They were asked to say how strong, how intense the flavor was. There were differences in other categories, like the desirability and the saltiness, but only for the picky eaters. Snacks in red bowls and blue bowls were perceived as saltier. Snacks in red bowls were perceived as less desirable. Hmm. So there's a third paper that says no red does not enhance the appetite. Now here's a uh, uh, yet another paper. This is uh, this was done in the uh, uh, cafeteria of a hospital, and they were trying to encourage people to eat good stuff by putting labels on it and testing whether or not red and green and various other colors would cause people to uh, in, enhance somebody's ability to, to pick something that's good for them. So in this cafeteria, they used red labels for unhealthy, yellow for less healthy, and green for healthy. And the phase two made the unhealthy stuff less accessible as well. Sales of red items decreased in both phases with a probability of 0 0.001 and green items increased in phase one. So basically this is yet another paper that shows that the commonly held knowledge that uh, red will enhance the appetite, that commonly held knowledge is wrong. It's actually not just, it's not like it's kind of right, it is pretty predictably wrong. Didn't these guys get the memo? Red label, Coca-Cola, a lot of soft drinks are red. And <laughs> this I found this picture of this, this sampler of, of junk foods, and I was surprised that almost all of it has some red on it. Fast food chains benefit through mimicry. They don't use red because it is stimulating the appetite but they recognize that red means you're in line for some scrumptious fast food, excuse me, fast food, not fat food. That was actually a typo that I uh, left in. So the three related hypotheses for red, uh, red associate, is red associated with specific emotions? Yes, I think we can say that pretty clearly. Does it evoke a specific physiological response? Well, there's a small effect or perhaps no effect. Does it, if, does it cause a specific emotional response? Sometimes, although we're not real sure. And the same thing, can it stimulate a specific action? Can it cause us to do something? Sometimes, but. In the big picture, if any color elicits an emotional response, it should be red. That was my initial starting point and the reason for choosing red. But the evidence for the psychological effects of red is nowhere near the claims that you see on the internet. Go figure, stuff on the internet isn't true. Huh. This is a slide that I put in basically every single lecture where I talked about color psychology. On the one hand, you have the pop psychology that you read on the internet, an ocean full of information available. But on the other hand, on the other hand, if you dig through it carefully, you look for the backing up at the evidence that backs these claims up, virtually non-existent. The real psychology on color is very small. There isn't, there's not billions of papers, and it's certainly not enough to support all of the claims that are made on the internet. So I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, John. That was terrific. Thank you. We can uh, please put our cameras on and let's... Um... Let's take some questions. You're free to put questions in the chat. You're free to uh, put your hand up. You're free to unmute and talk. I have a question. Uh, yeah, Jean, go ahead. Hey, John, how are you? Jean, good. I love the good. background. It is so appropriate for today. <laughs> it's red, you know. <laughs> 
Um, so, John, do you have any information or data on, um, you know, a lot of companies, a lot of packaging companies do visual recognition in um, store settings to see mm -hmm. what draws the eye to a package on the shelf? Do you have anything on that? Uh, I know that there's a university not far from me, uh, Clemson, that has that equipment, the eye tracking goggles and the fake storefront, and they print up packages. I'm really not familiar with their research, so I I wouldn't be able to comment on that. Well, it's and and certainly many of the brand owners do that as well. They yeah. have their their own little stores. It'd be interesting to find out if if visual recognition on the shelf. Um, just evokes a purchase response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one related experiment that one of my students had done was to create cereal boxes that uh, were devoid of graphics. So mm -hmm. if you imagine a, a Cheerios box that's largely yellow and a few other colors, make a, sim a box with the same amount of yellow on it, one big yellow thing, and then a red stripe and a little bit of the other colors. She made boxes that were uh, eight different cereals uh, and he had people identify the boxes based just on the color. So there's no graphical information at all being portrayed, just the colors. And uh, she was disappointed that she only found 50% recognition. And when I saw those results, I said, whoa, that, I mean, I don't think I would be able to pick out a lot of the cereals just based on the name or the, the the box. So to be able to recognize just on the color, half of the time, I think that shows that there is, that color does have a strong uh, effect when it comes to uh, being able to find uh, like a cereal box in a busy, in, a, in the cacophony of a cereal aisle. Well, and, and back to your um, uh, thoughts about the logos, you know, are you drawn to those logos? Same thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thank you. There's a question in the yeah. chat. It's a bit long, but it relates to blood, the color of blood and the sorts of associations that might develop because of that. Can you comment on the role of the color of blood in various associations? It has been suggested uh, with the uh, Berlin and K data where red came out as the first color to be differentiated. Uh, it has been suggested that maybe blood is the reason for that, that uh, it is an important color. When we see blood, it means, you know, we kind of should be doing something, paying attention. Uh, so that's a, that's a possibility. I. It's hard for us to to learn to to I mean if we could go back uh, in a time machine a uh, hundred thousand years ago and watch what's happening maybe you could decide that but I it's a very difficult question to an answer. Um, hey John. But, yes. Hey, I'm, I'm this this is Leandro. I I I was the one who wrote the question, um, but just I figure perhaps I can give a little bit of context to it. Okay. Um, if it, to to me the the thing that is interesting is that oh yes, let me turn on my camera. Hey everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So so to me that is interesting is that it all goes back to history and you know, uh, if you go back to history on 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 many different regions and many different beliefs, you know, religious beliefs and whatnot, then uh, a lot of it has stems from life, right? And and this this association we have with life in its whole binary form whether you're alive whether you're dead and you know and 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 basically the significance of life relates to blood as and even the color of blood changes from their iron oxide being you know or, or their iron uh in in the in the blood being being very red to to a very dark complex right uh, as it oxidizes and then pretty much life dies so, so I think there is a lot of relation to that. Uh, if you look at, you know, psychology books, anything that has to do with, you know, vitality, sex and whatnot, it relates to that color red on, on the dress, 
because it relates to vitality, relates to you know blood circulation, uh, uh, anything that has to do with mating as well and psychology. And, and these are many psychologists talking about it in terms of what makes a person attractive. Uh, and you know, uh, people exercising has a lot of blood circulation and all that stuff. So, so there is a lot of you know uh, related to blood, and that's the reason why I put that comment in there because I feel like perhaps there is something in the literature that relates to blood from more from the uh, psychological perspective, but there is a very um, how to say direct evidence that is uh, a physiological that I feel that is not tapped enough. Uh, perhaps from a, from a psychological response. So I figured uh, to put that because obviously you took the time to do all these literature search, uh, which uh, to me was wonderful. I am very thankful for that. Uh, perhaps it's something that, you know, <laughs> uh, could lead to, to a different type of search in the future. Because I put there as a comment, uh, more of a joke, if, if blood were blue, perhaps the lecture would have been in blue color <laughs> or perhaps if blood would have been green, you know, uh, then the lecture would have been in green color. So anyways, that's 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 if it. this were done by a horseshoe crab, uh, we'd be talking about uh, blue, <laughs> crab blue blood. Um, yeah, I, that's an interesting hypothesis and I it, it makes sense, um, but I'm not aware of any uh, uh deep studies that have gone into that. I'll I'll keep my mind and my ears open for that. Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. Lee, could, I ask, could I ask one quick question? Yes, um, sure, go ahead. Our, our world surrounds us with greens and blues and maybe browns and things. Um, so that's what we sort of think of as normal and blood, uh, and red is uh, there's a few things that sort of jump out like when an apple gets ripe it turns red so we n then know it's ripe right and that's how apples get their seeds spread right and all of the other um things that use that strategy so maybe it's the fact that it's sort of an extra in our life rather than a general sort of part of everyday life has a, a, some effect on the way we react to it yeah, I think that's, that could be. I'm not sure the uh, apples turning red, spreading the seeds. I'm not sure I, that I agree with that because uh, apples uh, oh. in nature wouldn't oh. be spread by humans, but by other mammals that wouldn't be able to distinguish between a red and a green apple. Oh, you're muted, Judith. I turned myself off again. I turned myself <laughs> off, sorry. Um, but one of the strategies of fruits is that they do turn red and then they attract people, uh, creatures or whoever eats them to take the seeds somewhere else. So um, it's, it's, it's sort of designed to be attractive to people who could, of course, lots of animals can't see red, but still. Mm -hmm. um, we can and I, I think um, insects and butterflies and things see see way more colors than we do don't they too so you know, it's, it's an interesting subject mm -hmm. there's one I don't know conjecture that because there's only certain primates get, that have tricolor vision and kind of when it evolved uh, it was fairly late in evolutionary terms and it evolved from primates that were in Africa and there was a fruit that was um, developing at that same time. So you could see when the fruit was ripened and there was more information that you could get by the third cone. So that's kind of one line of thought. And another line of thought is with the trichromatic vision, we gain quite a lot in terms of value contrast. So we're also able to, you know, see predators more easily and so on. So there is uh, at least some thought towards the evolutionary strategies of having the third cone, which opens up the warm colors. Like we have a warm color bias with the, you know, we have mostly the L and the M cones. A um, couple questions in the chat. Victoria asks, given that males are far more often so-called red-green colorblind than females. Does the effect of red on the male population 
muted. Do you know if they checked for so-called colorblindness in their studies? Well, there's a lot of studies here. Um, the dating uh, example, clearly they didn't check for colorblindness, uh, but I, I think it's standard practice in most most experiments that you would check for colorblindness first, but you may not. And obviously uh, having 8% of the males not be able to see red would, would have a, a big effect on uh, whether or not they uh, notice the, the food on the plate or the color of the plate. So um, I, I can't say categorically, but I think most of them did do that test. Thanks. A uh, question from Sarah in the chat. Sarah, do you want to unmute and ask? Yeah, it's it, maybe not even a question so much as just something I've wondered about. So with Berlin and Kay's third term being red, I, it, it's always seemed interesting to me that red is sort of right in the middle of the value scale between mm. white and black and whether it has something to do with that 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 midpoint of value so it's it, maybe less its color so much as its placement in terms of value uh but gray isn't uh cat you would think if that were the case that gray would be categorized categorized along with red and yes. but if the study because the study was so many different cultures and and the terms did i mean there's lots of problems with it. It was mm -hmm. Eurocentric and all the rest of it. Um, and the ter I don't believe the terms precisely matched up, the names precisely matched up with the many different language groups. Um, and so gray not have may not have been a word. Red may not have been a word. Um, but there would have been a category that Berlin and Kay would have um, decided fit whatever that vocabulary was. I seem to remember reading once that um uh one of the one of the language groups studied instead of using white and black they used moist and dry. Um so so a binary. Um anyway, so I, so, I, you know, so it could be that that what you're saying is why if it's if it's the midpoint in terms of the value scale why not gray? I think what I would wonder is perhaps um and I seem to remember also with that study that it eventually gets to 11 different language terms pink is one of them and gray is another um uh, anyway yeah just a just a query yeah I, it's a it's a thought um and then and then the 12th one comes along in certain languages like russian polish japanese uh where they differentiate between light blue what we would call cyan or cerulean and uh navy blue that we call dark blue they have single words that are considered basic color terms I think it's interesting that it's still evolving and that us uh, English speaking folks are not in the lead. <laughs> yeah, they redid their study too in the 90s um, and it tweaked it a little bit. And there's a separation of warm, cool colors before they actually, and they start to take into effect the fact that their name, they're not necessarily naming colors, but they're naming objects. And so that sort of ties in. I think it's interesting, your comment though. I, I don't know if anyone else knows or I see David Briggs is here. He might know a little bit about that. Could pigment availability have influenced the choice of the third term as red since iron oxide is found almost everywhere on earth? That's reasonable. Um, I think if you look at like the Lascaux caves in uh, France, the pigments that they were using included iron oxide red and umber. Uh, so that's plausible, plausible. David, do you have a comment on this? Um... I, I was actually just looking for a reference when Robin and my ears picked up and heard my name mentioned. And so, <laughs> you know, quite, uh, but I was just, I, I remember that um, John uh, colors, uh, flags often have red as a color. And John Gage has a comment in Color in Art that, um, that you know, that, that, that the 
official meaning of red in all these different countries is, is wildly different. He lists about 25 different different meanings of red, official meanings of red in different um, in, in the flags of uh, different countries and, and wild, often wildly different meanings. Mm -hmm. Sarah, do you want another comment? Um, or John, go John, go ahead. Um, when you say meanings of the colors and the flags, like you're thinking that uh, in the U.S. we look at the red in the flag and it symbolizes blood. That that's the sort of uh, association you're referring to. Yeah, let me just. Um, so the ones he lists are um, the official interpretations of the color red: war, blood, bravery, authority, fire unity, revolution, soil, sacrifice, faith, sun, freedom, revolt, swordsmanship and horsemanship, independence, um, law and order, law, law and authority, um, brotherhood and equality, nation, charity, vitality, friendliness, war. <laughs> well, ours, ours, ours are leaves, right? Our red leaves, which is a Canadian... Uh... A Canadian symbol is our red leaf because we have maple leaves that turn this beautiful red in the fall. So that's where we have ours, I think. So that, that's the symbolism of red, which I guess is maybe not exactly the same, exactly what you're talking about today, John, but I just uh, just mm -hmm. popped in. There, there does seem to be a very strong non consensus about what red means. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah, did you want to say anything more? Yeah, well, I, I wanted to say how much I really enjoyed that talk because you do hear so often, oh, this color means this and that color means that. And you're very kind of careful parsing through of, you know, research on on um, response, sort of scientifically gathered response of people to given colors. It's super interesting. Um, and, and it, it strikes me that, you know, as Albert says, you, you just don't see color in isolation. So a color is always bound by all kinds of layers of cultural history and personal autobiography. And, and so there's, you know, the idea of being able to respond to a color, what, what would that even mean? There is no such thing as, as well, any human experience that is in isolation and maybe especially color is, you know, it just doesn't exist in isolation. So, yeah. Anyway, I really, really uh, appreciated the talk. I, I, it was just terrific. Yeah, this, this has been a great, uh, a lot of fun putting this, this together. I think, uh, you know, I, I do want to make uh, make a comment in that. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about your talk, John, and I've been following you for a while, so I know you're very scientific, is that. Um, it's not that color psychology doesn't exist, but it's just that the the that pic picture you put between the you know the spoon with water and the ocean, is very realistic as to how much you know the the commercial side of things have pretty much exploded the significance of something that was supposed to be very specific from the get go, right? Just you know for sakes of uh, manipulation of 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 human minds towards a commercial end so i think i think this is something that definitely needs to or deserves attention of more people and, and i will encourage you to to disseminate it through many different platforms if you can use youtube because i think a lot of people watch it uh but you know well done kudos to you man thank you for for doing this very mu very much needed thank you in, in some sense, I'm disappointed because I would like to be able to hand to my students a, a simple guidebook that they can say, okay, if you're doing a logo for a company that is in the banking industry, then, or, you know, I, I would like to have a nice small set of rules that are universally applicable, um, but I'm, I'm disappointed that the, the real world is not that simple. I, I will take more encouragement than disappointment, John. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you know, like if 
it, it depends on where as well, right? You know, you see in Spain, for example, banks use a lot, you know, the red and the orange tones, whereas here in America, blue is the preferred color, unless it's tied up to patriotism where, you know, shades of, you know, white and red come into play with blue. So I think a lot of it has to do with what is the real, you know, meaning you want to attach to the brand. And I think, you know, people like, because uh, my my uh, my brother-in-law is in marketing and he does a lot of branding. He's a branding expert. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about Pantone and then my experience as a color science, it just makes for good conversations about, you know, breaking the rules, especially, right? And, you know, who knows? I think, at the end of the day, it, it's a more complex subject, but it's because it's complex, it's rich. And uh, I rather see it from the viewpoint of abundance of opportunities as opposed to <laughs> to scarcity, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. One more okay. round of applause for you. Very interesting, very fascinating. People are just so compelled. I find often first thing when I teach my courses the students, that's their strongest feeling about these associations with color. So I think having that wider perspective and um, teasing it out a little bit is, is as uh, Leandro was saying, very important to get across to as many people as we can. So thank you once again. Thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, please join us, uh, International Color Day, which is coming up March uh, 21st. We are having, if you are a CRC member, our annual general meeting. And then at 7 p.m., we have a lecture that's open to everyone. Udo was here earlier, but I think he's gone. He'll be talking about color in the built environment. So thank you once again, and see you next time. Thanks, John. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, that was great.